I think I, and I still, when I've told people about how it all came about, I, they're just like, what do you, that really happened? And I was it like, came off. What was it? Because it basically, we met because I had a shitty incense holder. You were you were burning an incense on your story inside of a plastic water bottle. Yes, <laughs> it was something along those lines. So we just moved into a new office and honestly, it stunk. It stunk like fresh paint and glue. And, you know, at that time, one thing that we usually use to whether it was mask a smell or just to freshen up the room was incense. And we have two favorite brands. Usually we use Kumba or Maps out of LA. But since we had just moved in, we didn't really have a holder. So what did we do? Put our collective minds together and we just made something up. We found a bottle cap, poked a hole in it, and basically just stuck a stick of incense in there. And it's kind of wobbly, not quite 45 degrees. And I posted on Instagram just because I thought it was funny. And lo and behold, an angel came and saved our day. Maybe we can start things off the very simple, can you introduce yourself and what you do? My name is Sloan Angel and I'm a maker. I have a clothing company, I'm a ceramic artist, and I'm a DJ. So Sloan, recognizing the jam we were in, reached out and decided to make us an incense holder. I was like, I have, I have the power to correct this. Yeah. I was like, my, my small part, so yeah. And here we are right now. And for people that haven't seen this holder, yeah, it's literally the simplest concept, but it just works so well. So it's a very beautifully made sort of holder. I mean, it's kind of a cup. Yeah, a cup, a yeah. fluted cup. Yeah. And then it's sand that you got from Malibu Beach. Yeah. And literally just stick the incense into the sand. Yeah. Very traditional uh, temple incense yeah. holders. Yeah, where yeah. A lot of users are always placing incense into it, so it needs to be able to hold all the ash and yeah. all the multiple incense sticks. Yeah, it's definitely a a common occurrence on our like coffee table. Yeah, right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So when we rolled up and met Sloan, it was something out of a movie set. He had a backyard pool. It was obviously a characteristically sunny day in LA. You have rays of light just beaming down on the water in the pool, reflecting off. And then when Sloan comes out and greets us, he sort of fits the vibe as well. He's kind of tall, slender, looks like he surfs. He's got a pair of Vans on that are well-worn, uh, a raggedy shirt. I think he had a pair of like just beat up jeans. Not that he didn't look like he was put together. It just felt like everything sort of came together and all made sense. When you start talking to Sloan, what's sort of interesting is that either he's really excited or he's just super passionate about what he's talking about, but he sometimes he's trying to work through his words. He's fumbling around a little bit, but you just get the sense of authenticity, the sense of realness from him. Like he's not really trying to impress you. He's just really excited about what he's doing. I think there's something about that that draws you in. You're just sort of naturally interested. You're like, man, I want to know what this guy's so excited about. And then when you start finding out more about him, you're like, oh, he's a fashion designer. He does ceramics. He's also a DJ. And then naturally you're thinking, how do these things all work together? How do they play against one another? And that's sort of the start of our conversation. Where did it all start? Tell me a little bit about growing up. Like, do you do you see a point in your childhood growing up where like, hey, you know what? I really just want to make things. I want to experiment. Because I think that's the thing that is important to be a quote unquote maker is that it really comes down to just trying and doing and having like a curiosity. Yeah, I mean, my parents, I would, you know, definitely have to credit for that. My father um, is an amazing craftsman and has been, I guess, put tools into my life since I was a little kid. And uh, I mean, I, he gave me my first little tool chest when I think I was three years old that I used to just, you know, take out and I'd be sitting in front of our wood pile where we kept the firewood and be nailing nails just into random boards and screwing and sawing and probably left alone with two sharp of tools from too small of an age. And then my mother was a, she uh, was a cookbook author and taught me, um, brought me into the kitchen very early and, you know, just taught me to bake and, and, to, and to cook. So all, and she, she's a painter. All my activities were creating with my hands that my parents started me on as like a very young child. What was the first thing you made? And what was the first thing that you were proud of? 
Is it, are those two in the same? Oh, I, yeah, I, I think some of the first stuff I made, I don't know if I even knew what pride was. I mean, I remember like, we still have like that I made in probably, you know, preschool. So three or four years old. I don't know if I, I can't remember if I knew the, the emotion of pride at that time. Maybe I did. Um, I remember when I was in, uh, maybe fourth or fifth grade, we were doing a, a fair for Halloween. And everybody was supposed to kind of, uh, make a game or something like that. And a lot of people were doing like guess the, how many M&Ms are in a jar and stuff like that. And I actually went out and made a ski ball Mm -hmm. set with like, I took, had my dad take me to the hardware store and he helped me and we cut and made an entire ski ball set for throwing tennis balls into the ski ball. And we brought this whole thing there and we were definitely far and away the biggest, (laughs) the biggest game at the fair. I remember being proud of that. So then how did that all lead towards? the path of fashion because those are very permanent fixtures in terms of like building stuff that could subsist far into you know beyond any season which i guess you could say fashion is not really in that it's very fashion as we know it currently i guess maybe is a little bit more disposable a little bit more quick and needs to turn over with each season for sure um i don't know i guess i'm i'm very aesthetically driven especially in people's appearance I kind of always had a a draw for how I looked to the outside world. My mother still tells a story when I was about five years old. She went out and bought me a, a new winter jacket without me being in the store, because why would you bring your five-year-old to go clothing shopping? And I, I wouldn't wear it because I didn't want to wear a big red puffy jacket. She said to me, well, I'm not buying you a new coat and you'll have to go to school cold. And so for the next month, I just proceeded to go to school without a jacket on until my mom. So aesthetics are really important from an early age. Very important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So fashion, I just always was drawn to it. Um, And when I, I didn't, I, I was a little nervous in the beginning and I didn't study fashion in undergrad. I actually studied economics. Um, Makes two of us. Economics seem like, how do you put it? Like an, interesting thing to pursue. Yeah. But in reality, like, I think it still has a lot of bearing. I'm, I'm glad I did it, but yeah, it does have a lot of bearing, but it, it, it seemed to me that I said, no, I wasn't quite sure which way I would go creatively. And I just wanted to be able to have a bit of a business background because I knew at some point I'd be working for myself. Like, what was it about sort of entrepreneurship or just being your own boss that you wanted to pursue? My ideas were what really got me the most excited. I tend to lose steam or and focus if someone gives me a project that's not, I guess, purely my own. Um, and so I didn't want to disappoint, I guess, other people or, or myself at the same time. So I kind of always had this idea that I'd be working for myself at the end of the day. So then as it currently stands, like, what was sort of your creative trajectory between all the things you sort of like do now? Like from fashion, ceramics to DJing. I mean, they all can happen simultaneously really, but like, was it sort of fashion design became boring and then that's when you looked at other things? I think it's not that fashion design, the actual design became boring. I think with the current landscape, I wasn't making the stuff that was, was what everybody wanted at the moment. Yeah. And I guess that's, a, that was a hard, I pill. guess that's the trend nature of fashion, right? Yeah. That was a hard pill for me to swallow, I guess, in the yeah. beginning. And I felt like I had failed and in return, I, 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 I wouldn't, I would rather make the clothes that I make yeah. instead of trying to adapt to these current yeah. trends. And so I, um, could, could you maybe give me some examples of stuff that you personally were like really feeling you just felt wasn't on trend or whatever? A lot of my clothes, they're, they're craftsman driven. I mean, they're, they're some of the finest fabrics and some of the finest labor goes into the clothes. And that wasn't, that wasn't what was drawing buyers at the moment. They were more interested in the logo or the brand than they were actually by the fit and the The story and the store and the craft of the, of the actual garment. So my clothes take a lot of time and can be in a lot of care and they're, they're very expensive to, to make and to buy. And so it's not what kids and what a lot of fashion was looking for. It's not what a lot of stores were looking for. I was, I started to look at other ways that I wanted to, I guess, communicate that really, right? Right. Express myself. So after putting down ceramics for about five years, Sloan jumped back into it. And I think a lot of this came down to sort of the combination of exploring something that he had some sort of foundation in, but just sort of relearning the skill, how to get better at it, how to improve upon it. And this combined with the meditative element of ceramics, which I think a lot of people talk about and a lot of people reference. 
I think this just ended up being sort of this perfect marriage for him at the time and something he could really get behind and start to develop. I learned how to work with Clay when I was very young um, in high school, and I kind of always kept it on as a as a hobby, as a as an outlet. And I had the um, you know the last you know five or six years, I had kind of lost it a little bit. I had been really busy with other work, and um, when I got out to LA and I was I was I was working out here, I really felt the need to get back into working with clay because for me it's much more than just the the making it's very meditative for me and it's very easy for me to kind of calm the rest of my my being down and before you were living out on the east coast right yeah i was raised in the east coast um, outside of washington dc in annapolis maryland and then i went to school first in in new orleans and then moved back to new york city and lived there and uh, I moved to Los Angeles about four years ago. How do you think that that sort of East-West relationship plays into your work? Do you think that it has, do you think there is a definitive East Coast, West Coast style or do you not subscribe to that? I don't think I subscribe to it at all. I, I can definitely see it if you want If you want to in the way you dress, you definitely can. Um, with my work clothing wise, I think it, I'm, it might've shifted a little bit out here. Um, to to West Coast, but with my with my artwork and my ceramics, I think that it's pretty universal. I don't think I I really play into that bit of it. So, at what point did you sort of turn this turn the corner and make ceramics sort of like a thing to dedicate yourself to? But from the sounds of it, it kind of was like yeah, the next sort of like career path for you. Yeah, right? it was less of an uphill battle if that if that makes sense. I mean, I put I put my heart and soul into all of everything I do work-wise. I just, I found that with fashion, going out on my own once, um, there was just, it was just a constant uphill battle and there were so many doors being closed and not as many opening. And with ceramics, not without trying, but without really forcing the matter, many people were approaching me and, and bringing me into opportunities that I wasn't even aware of. And it was just, it was just happening organically. And I just said to myself, like, don't fight this, this path because it was just, everything seemed to be aligning when, uh, with, with ceramic. Do, do you think the energy you put into ceramics is very much just like repositioning what energy you're putting into fashion? And it just so happened that fashion, what you want to achieve actually is a little bit easier to tell through the vehicle of ceramics. Cause I think that the things you mentioned, whether it's craftsmanship, whether it's price, like, I would generally think that most people see the quality and time spent in handmade ceramics where, versus maybe not necessarily seeing it on a fashion level. I think you, yeah. you're definitely right on. I didn't even, I don't think I'd even slowed down to think about it quite yeah. to that level, but you're totally right on you. Cause I think that's the thing that I, you know, especially there's something about ceramics and just seeing like, I mean, people may, might not be able to see what I see right now, but like behind me is like a rack full of things you've made. Yeah. Right. And I think there's a very intimate connection there. And it's like, that's something that I find really fascinating is that when you left the world of fashion to pursue ceramics, like, was there sort of a way that people saw it? They're like, Oh, what, what, like, were they confused? Like, Oh yeah, totally confused. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of people, even good, very good friends of mine had, didn't really know that I knew how to do this or had learned how to do this or trained. And, um, and so, yeah, when I started, I guess, you know, through the means of social media, people started to see what I was doing more and more on a daily basis. That I think a lot of people even thought it was a joke at first. They thought I was kidding around. Um, or they didn't even believe it was my work. They thought I was taking pictures of other people's <laughs> stuff and posting it. Yeah. How did that make you feel like for people to be dis I mean, is it dismissive? Would you say they're dismissive? In the very beginning, anyways. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, that made me feel... I don't know. I guess I, I, I wasn't really, I wasn't really looking for anybody else's approval or for why I was doing it. And I, I, I don't know. It, it didn't really, it hasn't really changed the way I, I think about it I, or, or the way I present it to the world. I just kind of thought it was, I guess I just didn't tell people a lot of stuff about me in the beginning. So this is the part of Sloan's story that gets interesting. How do you take a passion, revive it, and then turn it into a second career? 
He put together a few different steps to help him learn the art of ceramics. And along the way, he was able to find a few mentors that helped him develop the technical side of his craft. Well, the first thing I did two years ago, I uh, I created a warning in or a search in um, in Craigslist for jobs wanted and anything that had the keywords of ceramic, they would you know send me a flag anytime a job was posted, like a notification. Exactly. Yeah. And the first one came up was about a at a studio like a, a studio here that was a, a teaching studio about being an instructor teaching classes, and I went in and I interviewed. And I brought even in, like I had a portfolio that I had made in high school because um, I applied to uh, um, a few art schools and was actually accepted. I decided at 18 that I didn't think I was going to go to art school and I ended up going to a liberal art school and, and studying economics. But they told me, I did had, had a good interview with this woman and she totally shot me down, said I didn't have enough experience to teach kids how to, how to, how to use the wheel. And I just thought, wow, that woman must not have really liked me. So while Sloan struck out on his first try, his second attempt ended up being a lot more rewarding. He ended up connecting with Marina Kim, a Los Angeles-based graphic designer and ceramics artist. So the two, they both shared a passion for fashion. That was sort of an immediate talking point for them and allowed them to connect. So I worked with her part-time for about a year. You know, I really wanted to get back into it, work with someone who was running a business and kind of get the gist and see if, whether or not that was something I actually wanted to do or, or if I wanted to keep it as a hobby. And after a year with her, I caught, I had, I had started making my own, my own work. Her, her one rule was, the second I start selling my own work, I couldn't work for her anymore. Mm -hmm. Was that sort of a challenge for you to get to that level? No, I didn't more? even, I, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even give it two thoughts when she first said it to me because it was kind of during the interview process. I never thought I would, it would just, it just seemed so distant, um, to even consider it being, something that would be relevant. But one of the stores here in LA that sells my clothing, the owner had been seeing the work that I was putting on Instagram. And he's like, I really love it. I'd like it to be in the store next to your clothes. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I put them in and she saw the post on Instagram from the store that, and we had to have a sit down and say, yeah. oh, you know, it's time to, uh, it's time to leave. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of scared and excited because I really loved working with her now. I mean, she's still a very dear friend of mine, but it was a little intimidating that she was kind of kicking me out of the nest yeah, and saying, it's time for you to do this on your own. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it was a little bit after that that I got introduced to you guys yeah. and brought Alex into to glaze the incense holder. Yeah. Um, more recently, I had I'd been, I went to Japan twice last year. And on my first visit, I had been, I'd asked Morena, and um, another uh, potter, Adam Silverman, who also based out of L LA, for some recommendations on meeting some ceramicists in in Japan. Just to kind of, I wasn't looking to study. I just was looking to get my foot in the door. Um, I've been, you know, very inspired and pretty much obsessed with Japanese culture in all aspects, and but especially ceramics for a very long time. And I was introduced to a potter, um, Akio Nukaga, who's an amazingly celebrated uh, potter in, uh, in Japan. And I met with him in April just for the day, and we went and did some studio tours. And he ended up coming to L.A. in July to do a show, and I, I took he and his family out for dinner. And he invited me back to Japan, and I, I said to him, over email, I was like, you know, the only way I'd be allowed, I could come back to Japan would be if I could work with you and study with you. Yeah. And after a couple of weeks of silence, he wrote me back and he, he said that I could come over and apprentice with him. And so. Yeah. What was that experience like? That experience was maybe one of the greatest things I've, yeah. I've ever done. Had you spent a lot of time in Asia before? I've spent a good amount of time. Well, I probably more than most Americans in Asia, but, um, yeah, my, um, my aunt works for the, um, the Asian studies department at Harvard mm -hmm. and has brought, uh, my, uh, my brother and I to Hong Kong a few times. We were actually there for the changeover together. Mm. Crazy. And, uh, during college, I actually, I went to Tulane and my senior year was uh, hurricane Katrina. Mm. So we had a whole semester of closure and I actually ended up going to China and I studied in Xiamen at Xiamen mm. university mm. for a little while and then lived in Hong Kong. 
um, for a few weeks, also still studying Mandarin and kind of just exploring yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, uh, and I've done some manufacturing with clothing over there. So yeah. I've had, I have a little gist of Asia, but never Japan. The last year was my first time. I'd kind of saved it almost as a pilgrimage yeah. <laughs> to get to Japan and, and really have it. So I, yeah, I ended up going twice last year and I did a, a two week, um, apprenticeship with Akio in his studio. It was life changing. How do you think his process differed from your process? I mean, just like everything else, the Japanese have simplified and perfected the smallest little details. And I was, I wasn't, I, his work, uh, is very different than mine style wise, but I really wanted to learn how he ran a studio and how he worked in his kind of his production process. I just learned so much more than that. Just his, there's just, there's five or six more steps to everything they do than to what we do, but just to make everything perfect. They have, he's really found a way to work with clay and made it so effortless it seems, but through many, many years of. Yeah. How do you think your work looks like now versus before the apprenticeship? You know, from the exterior, it probably looks very similar. It's almost kind of like the guts have changed. Um, there's less error and there's, yeah, there's a much more higher success rate between pieces for everybody. There's a lot of, there's yeah, a lot maybe of, maybe you can explain a little bit yeah. the error for like someone that's not that familiar with ceramics. There's a, there's a lot of ways something can go wrong. There's a huge, there's a really long life process and life cycle to from start to finish of a ceramic piece. It goes through a long stage of drying. It has to be fired at least a minimum of two times. And by that, I mean, put into a kiln, which is a, a you know, a glorified oven and it has to be cooked. And, uh, so with that, there's, there's a lot of room for, for mistakes and for all your materials to either to, to back out or, or to, to be flawed. So your process, you can, you can really eliminate errors along the way just with a, with very simple steps, but that just need to be learned and, yeah. and taught. That changeover from going into ceramics from fashion design, like what did you learn from fashion design that was almost directly applicable to ceramics? It's certainly with my, my inspiration, um, and how I, I, I guess how my ideas evolve for, for my bodies of work, I think, um, is very similar to how I would start when you design a collection, um, really to bring in a mood and to bring in a lot of inspiration pieces of where you, what, what your aesthetic's going to look like and maybe my colorway or my, my palettes. I think I approach the start of each ceramic collection as I do as I would a clothing collection with the same type of research and uh, development, sketching, and uh, and stuff like that. I mean, the making process is just so for, it's so different from clothing to clay that that there's not much correlation there. But definitely in the development side, yeah. it's it's very similar. I, I'm glad that I have that training as a clothing designer going into ceramics. You know, between ceramics and fashion design and music, how much opportunity for experimentation is there? With ceramics, I feel like there's a huge amount of room for experimentation compared to fashion. I think right now with fashion, if you want to sell, you can't make too many mistakes. If you want to say mainstream and in the, well, at least in, yeah, in the hype beast eye, you can't, you can't really, can't really make a mistake. Uh, you have to stay I don't know. You really play to the masses, I think, at this point in fashion, as opposed to ceramics. There's no, I don't think there's really a guide for cool in, in ceramics. I think it can be, it can be a, many different, many different options. So fashion and ceramics represent very tangible mediums. In many ways, they're different from DJing and music. You generally feel music in a certain way, and it's about creating a personal relationship with the audience. Obviously, both require focus. It's just that there's a different level of focus. One of them is internal, focusing on the wheel, and the other one is external, and that's focusing on the audience. In many ways, everything else you do is very tangible, right? Like, yeah. I can touch your clothing, I can touch your, you know, a vase you make. Yeah. But the music is a little bit different. Yeah, how would you define the music you play first and foremost? Oh man, I play a lot of everything. Um, I've been I've been DJing or messing around DJing for almost yeah twenty years now. 
I got my first set of turntables when I was 14. Um, it was the one big Christmas present that I really wanted from my parents. And they were so cool that they went out and got me a set of techniques. And I still thank them every single day that they did that. I'm a, I don't know. I guess I have a lot going on in my head. I could be looking at you, but listening to something over here. Um, I guess ADD, but I don't, I don't know if that's the way I would like to describe it. So I always kind of have a soundtrack in my head. Since I can remember, I kind of wake up every single morning with a song that I know that I need to hear that morning and it can totally change, but my mood is really, I guess, de depicted by, by song. When I'm DJing, I'm happy and I love, I love to be able to kind of give that happiness to everybody around me. Friends say that I just like things that spin. It, it's very different, I think. Um, like with the, on the wheel, I'm, I, I'm in my own, you, you know, you could be talking to me and I, I wouldn't really be hearing you. It's very, it's one of the things I really love about it. It's very meditative for me. Um, just single focus, not much on the exterior world going on. When I'm DJing, I'm hyper aware of the outside world and everybody else's you know, mood because I'm, I'm really trying to, to affect that. But I get, I get the same type of fulfillment, I think, from both. It's just, uh, you know, one very interior and one very exterior. It, is there any way that you anticipate those two crossing over? Is there a way that ceramics, like, I guess what I was immediately thinking in my mind was, can you create a line that is defined by a genre of music and then all of a sudden you have like, let's say, I'm just making this up as yeah. I go along, but like, let's say you have a collection, three different collections, all inspired by different soundtracks. You definitely could. Yeah. I need you around more, Eugene. <laughs> um, I never had, I, I mean, I, I know what I listen to and I like to make when I, when I make ceramics, but I've never, I know I've never had a, like a, a series of work inspired by, by music, which is, which is interesting. The furthest I got was uh, someone wanted to shoot some of my work spinning on turntables to kind of mimic the ceramic wheel with the, uh, with a turntable. But so like maybe on the, on the musical side, like, do you think that as you, as you start to explore that more that, you know, how do you define sort of personal growth, whether it's music, whether it's ceramics, like, is, is that even something you strive for? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm really big on setting goals. Just, uh, you know, I keep a little journal and I set little goals for each thing that I do, even in friendship relationships and everything like that. I just try and always, you know, I guess achieve, um, with music. I think I set my goals with just getting better at the craft always. Um, it's not like I, I'm, I set monetary goals for it. I, I really, I've gotten to play some bigger and bigger venues and, you know, play some larger and larger events, which I'm just really, really grateful to do. And I guess, that would be a way of that I, I kind of consider my my improvement and my achievement with that ceramics. You know, since the my goals, you know, are for those, you know, actually for this year, you know, is to do my first uh, solo show. Uh, I'm I'm coming up into some group shows coming up in the early next few months, and so yeah, I'm I'm setting these these small little achievements, uh, not uh, or small little goals. Um, that I'm just trying to, I just want, I want more and more, I guess with everything I make, I, I, my goals are to get more and more people to see it and view it and experience it. In many ways, a DJ exists to move a room. Right. Right. And then does that sort of carry over into ceramics? Like, I guess, do you need to be that profound? I really want a, how did he do that? You know, a little bit of where did that come from? I never, and to reimagine, I guess, really, really, items that are kind of taken for granted and to show them in a new light, in a new way to, you know, to bring, I guess, reverie to them. Ceramics have been around for a long time. I mean, music too, but like what is innovation or what is progression in something that's been around for so long in your eyes? I think there's really something nice to even continue that craft um, in a time where so many things are, you know, being taken away from being handmade. It's really nice to for me to, to be able to keep creating them and to elevate them, to take, you know, a simple tea bowl and to be able to remake it and re, you know, hand make it and to give it, to give it again. And I guess to maybe add my, my little, my little take on it either through the glaze or through its overall experience, but still taking what was, what was made millions of years ago and to, to make my version.
So as we conclude the conversation, I think the one thing that strikes us is that he's really talented at identifying a passion and then understanding which mindset and which way of thinking applies to each creative medium. So whether he's a ceramicist, a fashion designer, or a DJ, every medium sort of takes a slightly different approach. And while Sloan's humility might not let it show, I think he has to be incredibly prideful of the fact that he's just generally fearless. He doesn't really care what you think or say. I think he's really about committing to an idea without any validation and simply going out there and doing it. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to define him as a maker. Based on everything that you've sort of, you know, experienced over the course of your life, whether it's success, whether it's whatever, just like the experience itself, how much of it is based on luck, would you say? Or how much of it was really just based on your personality and just doing it? You know, you never know if it's luck or not. I think if you're not doing it, it's never, you're never, like the luck's never going to find you because it's not there even to, to, to find. So I don't know. My father always says to me, no matter how you're feeling or how down you are, just always keep putting yourself out there. You know, no matter if you get shot down or if, or if the opportunities aren't presenting yourself, like you're never, you're never going to get a new opportunity if you're not out there to, to have it find you. Yeah, maybe luck is in there, and I think my you, you can't be a dick, you know. Like you gotta be, you gotta be nice. You gotta, you gotta put yourself out there. But if you're not making it, and you're not creating it. How can you ever be successful with it if it doesn't exist? If you'd like to hear more stories like this one and more from the world of creative culture and beyond, check them out at Makin.com. That's M-A-E-K-A-N dot com. Or search for us on your favorite podcast app. 